All right, we are set to start on class number 20 in the UBC ecosystem modeling course called FISH 501. Uh, so I would like to welcome you on Zoom and on Facebook Live. And I would also like to welcome Joan Steinbeck from Barcelona. And today we actually have uh, a picture from Barcelona as our startup background here. Uh, Jeroen lives up on the other side of the mountain, up there with the with that church, just over there, a kilometer or two down on, on the other side. But uh, I will be talking more about that in, in a few slides. Let me just uh, start off by uh, recognizing that UBC is at Coast Salish territory, and uh, we acknowledge here that we are at the traditional, traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish people. And uh, I would also like to remind you that uh, we have the recordings available at, uh, of, of these classes available at the Ecopart YouTube channel and on the Facebook page. And uh, I can mention that uh, we yesterday recorded uh, tutorial 11 and 12, that's the ones about maximum sustainable yield and uh, fishing policy and uh, they will be, uh, in some days, they will be available at the YouTube channel. And this is, by the way, an arm of the Fraser River. Vancouver is over there on, on the left. All right, and uh, lectures, you can find them all here, and that's also where you can find readings. And as mentioned a number of times before, we have a Slack workspace, and you can get admit, uh, access to that if you contact me. And finally, I would like to welcome Jerome Steinbeck to uh, give this class today, uh, which will be about the uh, inner workings of EWE, the source code, and also and including how you can build your own, and also a highlight of some of the new facilities or newer facilities uh, in EWE. And with regards to Jerome, He's one of those damn programmers I've been talking about. At least that's uh, what I used to call them. Jeroen worked with him for about 15 years now, maybe a little bit more. And uh, during this time, uh, he has become the core developer and caretaker of, um, of EWE. So when we have facilities to develop, uh, he's very much involved in that. And notably, he's taken the lead on how we deal with temporal and spatial background. He has a background in developing commercial software, and he has used that along with expertise on GIS to really strengthen the spatial side of EWE. Uh, so basically, if you have questions about spatial issues and EWE, uh, He's the go-to person. He's my go-to person for anything that relates to that. And it's been a pleasure to work with him for, for this time. And uh, I would, uh, with this, pass it over to Jerome. Okay. So thank you for the introduction. That's nice. Yeah, I don't have any cats. I've got two kids, and that's enough, as you see on the photo. Um, today, I want to, just, to talk to you a bit about what happens underneath EcoPath. I want to talk to you about the source code of EcoPath and how, uh, well, what, what I've been involved in and how that has brought us where we are today. Um, let me see. So I'll start following uh, Jason Link's example. I like that a lot. The take home messages that EcoPath EcoPath is built for use way beyond the Windows desktop. Most of you know EcoPath as a desktop software, but it can do much more. And you can use its computational models in many, many different ways for very different audiences as well. The, code is source, the source code is freely available and you can extend it and automate EcoPath running. You can do a lot of interesting things with it. However, EcoPath has no core funding and we need you guys, our users, to be involved in deciding where EcoPath goes next and also to help providing funding because there is no core funding. The last one, EcoPlay, EcoSpace plus two hopeless acronyms are fun. I'll hope that it becomes later clear at the end of the lecture. Um, in overview, I'll 
lift a little bit of a lid on the challenges to ecosystem modeling and how we deal with that in the source code of EcoPath. I'll talk a bit how you can extend EcoPath with plugins. I'll I know I'm taking advance of what you're going to be talking about in the next few weeks, really, but I'll briefly introduce the Ecospace from a conceptual level. I'll highlight a few important plugins for Ecospace. Then I'll show some showcases how we've used the Ecopath code to do something totally different. And I conclude with a little description about uh, the Ecopath ecosystem. So challenges to ecosystem modeling. As has become clear from these uh, lectures, uh, ecosystems are super complex, right? With feedbacks occurring back and forth throughout the ecosystem and processes cross traditional scientific boundaries. That, that's something that we find more and more, especially when we bring in climate change and fisheries, socioeconomics. I mean, we as ecosystem modelers have to work way outside our little black boxes that we're used to working traditionally. And we also include processes and time scales of, that span several orders of magnitude. Uh, one Achilles heel that we have right now is still that combined impacts of multiple stressors are still very poorly understood. So how do you model that? I mean, those are just all complex uh, challenges. And we know that the perfect model does not exist, as George Box said back in, uh, back in the 80s. Um, so how do most ecosystem models approach these changes? Well, you know, the easiest way, the, the way that you, it's the most popular approach is that people just hammer more features into ecosystem models. You make them more and more complex. Steve, Steve Mackinson called that a Franken model, a Frankenstein model. Um, and then there's the approaches that increase in complexity and difficulty at least, and are increasing, are, are less and less popular. So, I mean, you can merge existing models or you can keep the models separate and make them communicate and work together. Or you make models modular, modulate. So basically you can switch components out. You can bypass functionality. You can, your models become flexible building blocks in order to address larger questions. Um, and I think that's sort of where we need to go to. This picture is a very naive representation of that, but the, the idea of this chain that I've drawn here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this chain is just to, you should be able to switch hypotheses, include mechanisms, exclude them, and see if that, what it matters for your results. Um, for instance, words like end-to-end -end models, where people build one pathway of having models together that work together in one pathway, gives you such a narrow band of answers. The use for those is very limited. Uh, instead, assembly modeling that is happening under FishMIP or this kind of broader ecosystem modeling where you can try different approaches and see what works. Um, that's where we need to go. There's a whole, I mean, Beth Fulton already mentioned something along those lines. She said models need to be complex, but not too complicated. Willy, Jason, others have mentioned, uh, remember the sweet spot and uh, and Marta Cole will present um, in a few weeks from now how we dealt with modularity in EcoOcean. I'm just going to address this story now from the code end. But what does this mean for EcoPath itself? Well, with, with since I've been on board, the strategy for EcoPath has been just focused on footprint dynamics. We may have proxies for other things on board, like for instance, a value chain, we may have um, uh, attraction models. And we might, might have modules that can help you, that, that can work with the fringe sciences, but those should also be replaceable by links to real models and real science, like real external sciences. We're just very good at food web dynamics and fisheries. So we needed to make sure that Ecopath could extend its functionality. You could bring in other logic that, that is, was paramount. Uh, you want to be able to switch hypotheses. So if something doesn't work, you want to try something else. You don't want to be locked into one, one idea only that doesn't work. And what's also been very interesting is to separate technical and scientific issues. So, I mean, by modularity, by, by separating your technique and your science, you can, with simple technical solutions, un whole new, unleash whole new batches of science. So conceptually, it's very powerful. And this is a broad ego path with ego sim where we are today. So now bear with me. We're going to get technical to the source code. Um, I came on board in around 2005 with, uh, the, where the, with the modern ecopath with ecosim. 
And at that point, Ecopath had been a desktop software since the early 1990s, but it had reached its technical limitations, most notably when it comes to working with other models. Uh, on top of that, Ecopath 5 was based on Visual Basic 6 that was going to be deprecated in 2005, and that was not very great. The Microsoft was dropping support for the programming languages that Ecopath had been resting on, and that didn't bode well. So we need to do something. There were thousands of users, hundreds of models, and lots of publications, and what to do next? So we decided to reprogram. But yeah, of course, there's an immense scary part to that. Like overhauling something that works is often equates to killing it. And so that was that was a scary bit. But we, uh, well, it's a bit of a spoiler, but I mean, we went on with programming and we're still here. So we probably did something right. Um, the aims of programming Ecopath 5 to 6 were a couple. We wanted to update to a modern programming environment to extend the lifespan of the software. We want to make sure that Ecopath was designed for connecting with future data, future models. We had no idea what that would be, but at least we should be able to do it if those needs came along. Um, we also wanted to extend with future logic. So yeah, Ecopath had certain capabilities, but we certainly wanted to keep adding on to those when the needs arose. Um, and that meant just so basically we had to design Ecopath for uses that we could not foresee. That was um, from an, that's challenging. Um, we also wanted to allow additions of custom code without having to change Ecopath's source code. That was not Achilles heel, I'll, bring, I'll get back to that later. Um, Ecopath needed to be run on other operating systems and needed to be translated in other languages, which is something now we're working on with Santiago, for instance. But, but Ecopath model results should not change. Ecopath had a whole host of uh, existing models and results and publications. We cannot certainly have Ecopath producing fundamentally different results uh, due to this recoding. And the computational code should change as little as possible because Carl and Willi and others who've been working on Ecopath for years should still feel familiar in the, in the recoding. So that all, that were a bit constraints around the software. So, um, I put a little check mark, checklist there on the side where we'll see what we can tick off uh, when we go through the slides. So, um, so we opted to program Ecopath in .NET, Microsoft.NET. There's a Microsoft programming environment, which is a huge development community and a huge commitment by Microsoft to multi-decade support to keep that language ready. Um, .NET is basically a framework for building any type of software that is highly compatible with Visual Basic 6, but also can do other things. Um, one of the cool things about .NET programs is that .NET is a big library of code, building blocks for building applications, and any program that you build on .NET in turn becomes a building block for of, of new building blocks, and like an, a library of new building blocks that you can use for further software development. So you basically you yeah you become a, a Lego box for programming, like a, a toolkit for programming. Donet had another additional set of benefits. It was in principle operating system independent. It was built for interconnectivity, so that that would at least crack open the door for a future extensibility. .NET locally supports things like localization that you can basically switch uh, uh, user languages. You can translate interfaces to to whatever language you want. Uh, .NET would not care. And cool thing as well is .NET is based on something called the Common Language Interface, which is an overarching language set that is supported by a whole load of other computing languages, which meant that you can basically use .NET code in a whole range of programming languages, and those programming languages are interchangeable. That, that allows for a large uptake of the software that you write in .NET. Um, to give you a bit of a representation of what the representation what this looks like, uh, if you have in the top the development environment, you have code in different languages that all gets compiled down to something that's called the common language infrastructure, which is an like a system neutral language that then with an operating system runtime environment can translate it to code that the operating system can run. But because this common language infrastructure has interfaces to different operating systems, your code is in principle able to run anywhere. Which is, you know, that's nice. You write your code once and you can then utilize it on different, um, on Mac, on Windows, on Linux, uh, and etc. So that was cool. Um, about the features of EcoPath 6, we, um, we translated all the computations uh, to Fubi.net, but the user interface was uh, insalvageable. That was uh, entirely reprogrammed. 
Um, as Philly already mentioned in uh, previous uh, sections of uh, Fish 501, there were funding limitations, so that meant we could not bring all the features over, uh, such as Eco Ranger, Automass Balance, they didn't make it, and other features have slowly been returning. Uh, but um, maintaining identical results, yeah, that is an ongoing challenge because we, every time we add new features, you just have to make sure that things still work as they should, which is not always the case. And Mimi Lam on this call can attest and others. So um, as to the code structure itself, uh, we totally ripped Ecopath 5 apart. We separated the computations from the data access, use interface, etc. Everything was as separate as possible. Uh, we separate computational models, searches, etc. Everything turned into little building blocks that were had as little as possible to do with each other. Um, and we added a plugin system to externalize the addition of external code. I'll show a little bit more what that means, but that basically sets the last few ticks here. Um, but I, I'll, I into, included this picture that Philly likes to show. Instead of having a big car, you've got a big car made of little building blocks. That is uh, sort of what an uh, ecopath could be, how you could see it. Um, in practical, in, an, in, an, in a diagram, this is what ecopath looks like inside. We have the core. The core hosts all the in computational models, ecopath, ecosim, and ecospace, which are largely intact as they were in ecopath version 5. Um, there's many more features involved, etc. But the code, the flow, the, the the way data is maintained, all that is very much Ecopath 5. But the interface and the data source, data source is just whatever you pull data from. It could be a, an Ecopath database, could be something else. That can be switched. Um, interfaces, well, you know the desktop interface that's the software you work with on the computer, on Windows, but that could be something else. And then we have this thing as plugins. I'll tell more about that later. Plugins are basically bridged to anything else outside the Ecopath and Ecosim software. And plugins give you a lot of power. So this is conceptually how, we, how Ecopath 6 is constructed. This is important to know because this is the, basically the foundation upon which we've done a whole lot of fun things later on. So what this means for programming with Ecopath? So here I visualize a little bit what I said earlier. Um, .NET is a huge library of, of functionality about use interfaces, working with files and stuff that comes from elsewhere. You want to sell the data somewhere else, working with data classes, etc. Just this, this .NET framework is huge. And it's not only built for scientific analysis or statistical analysis, it's built for web applications, for games, for data mining, machine learning, there's .NET is massive and heavily supported by Microsoft and a good fraction of Windows programs actually rely on .NET. So Microsoft, that's a good thing. Microsoft cannot ditch .NET anymore, not, not without a huge fight. So that's a safe bet to bet on. Um, the Ecopath code has something similar. We have building blocks for user interfaces, building blocks that allow you to build plugins, the core models, with utilities, and there's a program that uses these building blocks that in turn use .NET. But what you can do, you can write your own code down here below where you just use .NET and use Ecobath to build your own code. And here's your really clever bits. I'm looking forward to seeing those. So basically, dot, yeah, you, whatever you built in .NET can be used by other software to refine and to build up and further, which is potentially very powerful. So for instance, now let me, Let's go even a little bit, a little bit deeper. Here we have a little bit of code that is super, super simple, but it shows you a little bit what 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 .NET can do here. Um, as every computing language is always a bit of bells and whistles to that 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 you need to state in order to make a program work. In this case, we uh, we start a module, we have a main subroutine, and here we create from the Ecopath core libraries. We take we create a new core. Remember from the picture before the core was the building, the big thing that held Ecopath and Ecosim and Ecospace, etc. Um, you don't need to remember this, but the core is basically the traffic control between all the models to make sure nobody does anything stupid at the wrong moment. I mean, you can only run Ecopath if a model is loaded. You can only run Ecosim if Ecopath is balanced. All these kind of preconditions and tests. Well, anyway, here we create a new variable of the type core. We tell it to load a model. We run Ecopath, and then from the core, we um, ask uh, the Ecopath statistics to provide us with the total consumption. We write it to the screen, we close the model, and that's the program. So this really, uh, this initializes Ecopath, loads a model, runs Ecopath, um, 
and takes the value out of the out of the out of the, the running model. That's cool. I mean, this is this is really this is what the user interface does. This is really actually using EcoPath. You can say, say the same thing also in another language if you like. You can say it in C sharp. Looks very similar. Or you can say it in Python. So I mean, you can using the .NET libraries and our the .NET building blocks that we've brought, Joe and I, and Vili and Carl and others. Yeah, you can program against that in very different languages. And of course, this sim this example is very silly and very well, very basic, but you can make it much more complex. Uh, take for something, uh, for instance, something like this. I added a few code comments here to make sure that it's a bit more legible, that you can flow a bit better, see the flow a bit better. Here we are again, we create a new core, we load, we check if uh, the load worked. If it didn't, then here it says, no, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't load the model, sorry. Okay. Um, it tries to, it runs EcoPath and it iterates over all the groups and takes the estimated EcoPath outputs and writes the biomasses of those different groups to the screen. Well, that's cool. You know, you load Anchovy Bay and run EcoPath and then take all the estimated biomasses and put, put those on the screen. It gets a bit more complex like that. So you, you it's not very difficult. Or, or one more. This one, um, same thing. We have a core, we load a model. Uh, we remember the biomass of the first group and we create a variable here that is called number of balanced, and we, and we set it to zero. We also create a new random generator, and for two thousand times, we're going to vary the biomass of this of this group by plus or minus ten percent. We run EcoPath. If it run, that means if it balanced, then we count we count that number. And at the end, doing this two thousand times, we say, okay, of two thousand random perturbations of the biomass, how many models did actually balance? It's not a very sensible. Uh, example, but it shows you that you can get actually inside EcoPath and EcoSim and EcoSpace as well with code. And you can do anything that the EcoPath interface does and more. And I hope this illustrates a little bit the kind of power that you have with only but not so many lines of code. Of course, there's a learning curve. Of course, you have to figure out how we have structured the code. I mean, something that, that we have a core, that is something that Joe and me decided because we thought that made sense just a design choice, right? So there's always a learning curve in trying to understand how a code library is structured, like with every programming languages, every programming language. But once you're there, programming is not that complicated. And so, yeah, what can you do with coding? Well, Vili also has highlighted this already. Coding can be very useful. So you can basically replicate everything that the EcoPath interface does, but you can also change or add computations or interfaces. And what is especially useful is uh, automate the execution of EcoPath. You know, you, um, EcoPath has gotten some uh, some flack, the, the desktop software, for that it's hard to replicate runs because, I mean, there's lots of screens and lots of settings. Not all settings are retained. So to reproduce a run as it used to be, as you had it once, is not always easy. Well, through code, it will be 100% uh, the same. So it's easy to reproduce your runs. So for production runs, it doesn't hurt, for instance, to script your runs and script the production of output once you have it all set up in your EcoPath user interface. You can also for, perform batch runs, like uh, run large numbers of scenarios or do large perturbations experiments or so those kind of things. I mean, you don't want to think of doing that in the user interface. You write a little script like we showed on the pages before just to uh, to execute this automatically. Just go away and go shopping or go to bed and see what it, ha what it come out with in the morning. You don't want to do this manually. Manually, is, using the interface is error prone. That is definitely a, a fact. Um, of course, having the, the rich user interface is also the reason EcoPath became su su successful. But I think the power is in using both. Use the interface for building your models and then using coding for doing the, the longer experiments and using your balanced model for something else. Yeah, performing uncertainty assessments, and another thing that is super cool, we can also integrate EcoPath in other modeling and complexes. So let not EcoPath take the lead, but let EcoPath be pushed around by something else that simply needs food web dynamics. You can do such cool things. It's fun. So, etc. cetera. Um, a few examples. This is something that we do quite frequently nowadays um, because EcoSpace that we're going to be talking about a little bit later today is quite demanding in terms of file space and then processing space. You can run 
eco space on a cluster, on a Linux cluster, on a supercomputing machine. Um, of course, you can't run the use the the, the rich use interface. You just write it into a little script. And in this case, yeah, we have done it with Vidi several times that we have the run instructions. We have a model in text format, forcing data, uh, fire off a job and come back tomorrow, see what Ecospace has done on, on another operating system. Another very cool example was this one where we had Ecopath, uh, Ecospace running on a server here in uh, in Vancouver, where Vili is. And it was communicating over the net with Atlantis running in Hobart and Atlantis and Ecospace were running together. Atlantis did the big nasty modeling and used Ecospace for food web dynamics. And the two models interface, talked together and performed runs together. This was an experiment to see how far we could push things. It's, I don't think it's ever been published. Vili can tell you that because uh, he was involved now. He's not, not published, he, was, he uh, really shakes his head. But it was just a proof of concept that was just a lot of fun and showed you the potential that you could, uh, that you could use these tools for. In, uh, I, I wrote a paper in 2016 where I managed to get the other Ecopath, uh, about the Ecopath source code. And this is a figure from that, uh, from that paper where here you see Ecospace as being a little building block in something much larger. There's a regional scale models that, that deal with regional scale catches and effort and brings it to file scale, fine scale dynamics where Ecospace then computes uh, species biomasses. Um, I'm not going into the details of this, uh, this figure that is based beyond the scope, but uh, there's the, re the, the reference to it, Dish Montreal 2013. But it just goes to show that, yeah, Ecospace can be, can be put somewhere else to use. It is, uh, it's, it's, it's cool, it's powerful. Um, this is something that is uh, ongoing work. Uh, where people are, uh, some people are just good in R and don't really want to learn to use .NET. Well, in this case, this little, this is an uh, experiment where R is in the driver's seat and just pushes e uh, Ecopath around. So we have an Ecopath model that we have a little tool that exports itself to, C to CSV files. Uh, R reads those and makes perturbations in the inputs. Uh, fires it off to run. So, uh, it, so there's a .NET application. The blue ones are .NET, uh, the green ones are R. So the .NET tool takes the original model, takes the perturbations, integrates those, produces output, R analyzes that, produces some useful summary, and then may repeat with further perturbations in a loop to, to for whatever. No, this could be uh, a fitting exercise. It could be something else. Uh, this could be a way to understand your ecosystem better. But the idea is here that R is in the lead, and R just uh, orders Ecopath around. Those kind of tools, I mean, I hope you can see the potential of these kind of exercises. The, this, 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 yeah, I mean, the sky's the limit like this. Um, one final note, I think I, I should mention this, that 2016 paper, what was very cool about it, I was able to get uh, the other authors of other Ecopath uh, models um, builders of other Ecopath models in different languages on board as well. Um, to date, uh, there's the .NET version, the one that we're writing, but also a Fortran version, a MATLAB version, and an R version of Ecopath. If .NET is so versatile, why are there other languages? Why, why did they build them in other languages? Well, that's basically for other, just for other applications. Um, the Fortran version was built to, to directly integrate with hydrodynamic models at the time scales and time steps and all those kind of things that those modelers like. Uh, the MATLAB version was built for uncertainty testing. Uh, this was pre-EcoSampler. EcoSampler basically uh, brought functionality that MATLAB would have tried to try to create to the approach. And the R version, uh, yeah, it's just basically for those who prefer to work in R. R is not compatible with the common language interface, the one I showed earlier. So R is an, in a leak of its own. Well, this is just a version of R that you can use um, if you prefer R. Uh, so valid or not, I mean, I th think that's totally valid. Uh, all the versions still rely on the rich use interface of the Ecopath uh, mothership, the, the, the .NET version, to produce and fine tune and test models. But uh, after that, they can take it. And do their thing. I think that's very cool. I mean, it, um, there's certainly no competition. It's just more strengthens the approach. I mean, uh, I think it's very, very interesting. So if you'd like, uh, check the 2016 paper out. Uh, it is technical without becoming too technical, uh, but the concepts are, I think, uh, quite illustrative. So that about the base source code setup.
And now I want to talk a little bit about plugins and how you can extend the EcoBath approach. Um, plugins came simply because there was a need uh, that arised in, arose in EcoBath 5. Uh, it's very easy to modify open source software. If you have the source code, you make your modifications fine, but what on earth do you do when the source code changes off that master, the master software that you've changed? What, what they come out, if they come out with a new release and, and there you are, you have your changes that are suddenly and a, and a new source bait and, and you need to somehow merge those two. And it's not handy. You know, you can keep lots of older versions of code, of the older code uh, aside and in versions, but yeah, if you then need functionality from a newer build, you have your code is still in the old one, and that's not handy. You can manually transfer your code changes, and that was the nightmare of Cameron Ainsworth. He every time he had he was the one coding EcoPath five, and every time Billy and Carl came out with a new version, Cam had to resolve his code and take all his changes out and put them painstakingly back into the into the new version of the code. That was not handy. You can use version management software that takes part of that load that camera is doing by hand off of you. But still, I mean, if the code that you work with has changed to such a degree that your code doesn't work anymore, you still have to sort it out. So it's, it's, they're all basically banded solutions without providing you anything, what you really need. So what we decided to do is we, we, we did something that at that time, we're talking 2005 now, was already becoming quite commonplace, use plugins. Um, Plugins, you know, nowadays you see them everywhere. Uh, browsers have plugins and, uh, you know, GIS software has plugins that basically external pieces of code that ex ex enhance the functionality of the tool that they plug into. So we decided to keep the modifications uh, of a user code totally away from the EcoPath code. And only when the EcoPath code structure changes, you get conflicts. So basically, if, we ch if, if the code uses certain um, function calls in EcoPath, and we changed the shape of the function call. Yeah, and suddenly this external code wouldn't work anymore. But beyond that, your code will keep working as long as we behave. And of course, for this reason, we try to make sure that we never ever, or as infrequently as possible, change the structure of the EcoPath sort code. So in principle, it works like this. Plugins are just basically code libraries that build upon the EcoPath software, but the source code lives independently of EcoPath. Uh, plugins are recognized and auto-loaded by the EcoPath desktop software and startup or by the EcoPath core, actually, because it also works on, on, uh, on Linux and Unix, et cetera, outside the desktop interface. And plugins are included in the program flow. Um, to give you a little example, these are all, we call them plugin points. These are points that, that Joe and I and Willy have identified as key points where it might be interesting to hook into external logic. And we have plugin points throughout the code and we put them mostly about strategic events like for instance, uh, EcoPath initializes. Well, you might want to do something too. When a model is loaded, you might want to do, you want, want, might want to respond to that. When a model is loaded after the fact, sure, fine. Or when EcoPath is running, when mass balancing happens, when the ecosystem is loaded, when ecosystem is, is starting to load, when it has loaded, when ecosystem starts running, when a time step is executed, all these kind of events could be useful for other knowledge, for other, other code, in order to tap in, get access to the EcoPath data that it has, and, and, and do your own thing. I mean, you can probably imagine that this is what the value chain heavily relies on. In order to compute the value chain, when EcoPath runs, or EcoSim runs, it needs to capture the catches or the landings at least and bring them to the value chain for analysis. So this is something that the value chain is, is fundamental for. The fundam this is what the value chain is built on. Um, so yeah, the, the, there's tons of plugin points everywhere that are related to model flow, model execution. There are specific plugin points for specific modules. I mean, here, for instance, here's one about Monte Carlo. If you remember the, the eco sampler logic that we saw last uh, last week, eco sampler listens to Monte Carlo. When Monte Carlo finds a mass balance model, uh, eco sampler stores it. Well, it can only store that because it's listening to the Monte Carlo plugin points. And Monte Carlo found something. Eco sampler grabs the data, stores it somewhere, and just waits for the next one. It's as simple as that. I mean, the code underneath is a bit bit more painful, but the idea is simple. There is plugin points related to user interfaces, so you can extend menu items, you can extend the navigation tree, you can create option pages, you can respond to help requests, etc. Things about data, and 
and of course because this software is constantly under development if you need more plugin points well let us know and we build we include more triggers in the code it's it's very simple um and onto this system a whole range of plugins have been built some of them already have been shown in the in in the course um let's backtrack one moment because why build things in plugins if you can also build them into the software itself? Well, the reason for that is more like to to keep the size of the software under control and see the plugins more as optional logic that you can use, but you don't have to. Uh, if you remember the Ecopath installer, if you install Ecopath, you can select which plugins you want to install. Now that is, uh, you can keep your software lean or you can just uh, install the whole shebang. What we ideally would like to work towards to right we don't have it yet we need uh, funding and time and uh, and maybe one of you thinks it's a fantastic idea let's talk but anyway we need an, uh, a repository similar to cron for r where you can download plugins on your own from an from an from web servers right now they're all shipped with the ecopath software uh but that is not so handy uh, it is much nicer people just totally independently can write their own plugins and distribute them on their own add them to the repository and when you run ecopath you can just get them on your own but anyway we there's a whole there's a whole array of plugins that uh, some of them can be installed uh, and some but with ecopath others are more still things in progress or need further funding uh, the ones in bold i'll talk about a bit more later today but we have plugins related to doing analyses as eco int as you remember as eco trough network analysis uh Shayar, you asked about uh, discussing network analysis indicators in uh, slack or isn't it uh, maybe you can do that uh, maybe you can spend a moment in the next few sessions about that anyway uh, eco engineers new i'll talk about that there's plugins about uh, data retrieval plugins about data export automation usability etc and we are actively in discussion uh, if, for instance, uh, we can further our collaboration with Acomax and Fishbase, but even Global Fishing Watch, they're interested in seeing if they can allow Ecopath to hook directly into Global Fishing Watch. I, I think uh, that could be super cool. That, that's such a nice data set. And we're also working with ODIS. It's a new data repository from uh, UNESCO. And uh, I'm having a meeting with them next week to see what we can do and if... if uh, if there, if it, there, it would benefit the Ecopath community to forge a direct link between their data warehouse and, and Ecopath about envir uh, environmental data. So this, uh, yeah, with plugins, you just uh, the, the the options are endless. Um, a few examples of plugins. You remember we've seen the ecological indicators plugin that uses Ecopath, and Ecosim, and Ecospace, but also network analysis indicators to uh, build uh, derived um, derived indicators. Um, it's again, it's a highly extensible system. You can add more indicators to it. That 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 requires some coding. Um, you need Ecoint requires that you set up your model and you add taxonomy. So, for instance, uh, I don't think Philly has shown that, um, but you can for every functional group you can attach. To, you can you can describe which species contribute to the functional group and the, the traits of those species, and to what proportion they uh, species contribute to the biomass. Uh, a nice a nice detail is that you can search for species in different uh, species repositories, and those search engines are in turn their plugins. So we can add more search engines without having to change the Ecopath code. That's just cool. I mean, yeah, this is this is a search engine that uh, uses the sea around us, species repositories. We also have one for worms. We built one for fish base that needs a bit more further work. So you can just reach out to different repositories and find your species and connect them to your Ecopath model. It's nice. Um, about the taxonomy, um, need to remember that multi stance groups can only have one species attached which is uh, makes sense okay uh, and the limitation is that species composition of functional groups uh, you can you say how much a species contributes to the biomass in the traits form also how much they contribute to the species catches those values are static that uh, that's a bit of a limitation yeah, and Intent produces, uh, using the plugin structure, it produces a whole whack of indicators for Ecopath, for Ecosim, for Ecotracer, or Monte Carlo. This is very, very akin to how the value chain works. I mean, the principles underneath are the same. 
And uh, here, for instance, that uh, this is what Marta showed a few day, a few weeks ago, um, that Equint also produces results from Monte Carlo. Uh, so basically, here it creates an histogram for the base value of an indicator based on the perturbed models that the Monte Carlo found. And here it produces that the same data as a line plot. Um, this was done before EcoSampler sampler came around. Um, but the EcoInt also uh, listens to EcoSampler. Another plugin, oh no, no, let's start now. Let's, uh, the other plugins are more EcoSpace related. I, I felt a bit cheating here because, um, oh, do we, you have any questions at this point before I roll on? I, uh, I think it's good to discuss EcoSpace, uh, at least conceptually, but we may have some questions. We've uh, we've had quite a few on the chat, uh, and I think most have been answered. Uh, but uh, if anyone have questions, please go ahead. Yeah, why not? Yeah, I'm not trying to follow the chat. No, no don't need, don't worry about that. No, I can see you there. That's nice. I've got the cameras here. So if you want to ask something, uh, turn your camera on and wave frantically, and I'll uh, I get you. Okay. So, still with me? Shall we carry on? Okay, I'm going to show you a little bit about Ecospace. I think Vili and others will do a much more detailed uh, discussion of this in uh, days to come. But in order for the story to make sense, you need to have a bit of the basics of it. So, what is Ecospace? It's a two-day, two-dimensional, time-dynamic, spatially explicit version of uh, of EcoPath and EcoSim uh, used to assess several things uh, that relate to spatial distributions. So you want to know where your species are and where your fishing effort is. Uh, it, you can use it to explore management options. For instance, the impact of, uh, of fishing restricted zone areas. We call them MPAs in the software. Um, you want to explore the ecosystem impact of fishing and the spatial distributions, uh, for environmental change or habitat change, or combinations of the above. So um, an ecospace is not any better than ecosim. It's just spatial. So if your questions are not spatial, don't go here. If your question is spatial, then EcoSim is, of course, not going to cut it. That is quite straightforward. And EcoSpace relies on a balanced EcoPath model and relies on EcoSim. It, you don't have to fit your EcoSim model, but it, uh, generally that's a good idea. Um, so it's a spatial mesoscale version of EcoSim where ecosim is executed in a spatial grid of homogeneous cells, cells that are assumed to have this at least the same size, um, and but different properties. Every cell can be different, different habitat, different MPAs, different conditions. Um, species can migrate. Uh, species can move across the uh, cell borders. Um, so this, the cells are linked through movement of organisms and fishing effort also moves around. Um, Ecospace, of course, logically includes a spatial variation in, in the primary productivity. And it also has something like the cost of fishing, to, for instance, to uh, make your fishing fleets uh, stay closer to port and things like that. What is very cool about Ecospace, it includes a dynamic species niche model that uh, we'll talk about more. And there's different ways that functional groups can move. They can disperse, advect, and migrate where dispersal is just uh, the, basically the, the random movement of going about your day-to-day -day business. Advection is when things are carried on the currents and migration is the kind of movement that ecospace cannot predict. Uh, that's just uh, the patterns that some species follow in their movement that you have to force the system to adopt because it's not a, not a logical consequence as far as ecospace can see from the change in environment and fishing, etc. Um, Ecospace requires a number of inputs. It, you need a base map. You need to say, okay, where's water, where's land? Um, water, you, water can have a depth. If depth considerations are not important, you can hold a map, can be one meter deep. It doesn't really matter. Um, and it needs some, it would be good to have a pattern of primary productivity. Um, you need to state how species move. So dispersal rates of each functional group are necessary. And then you have to say, uh, in order to make Ecospace interesting, to see, okay, how species utilize available habitats or how you, species respond to environmental conditions. Uh, and you can also mix those two, combina those two assumptions. You can have habitat, you can have preferences uh, for specific substrate types, 
and sensitivities to environmental conditions. And there's a whole range of further uh, variables ecospace can be customized further with. Um, those, Vili, you're going to be discussing those and showing this probably next uh, next sessions in the in the meeting. So I let's just uh, let's not dive too deep here. Um, what is important to know is that you have fishing grounds enclosures. Here you see, for instance, two MPAs that are overlapping here uh, in Anchovy Bay, um, etc. And let's leave it at that. So, and what does Ecospace give you in turn? It gives you spatial temporal estimates of biomass, catches, effort, uh, discards, not since not so long. And through Ecotrace, it can give you contaminant distributions and, uh, and, and the concentration in the food web. And through Ecoint, it can give you spatial temporal indicators. There's several other features into it. For instance, you can extract data uh, as maps for a different time set or maps per year or for the, all the functional groups. Uh, but there's also something that uh, use regions. You can sketch regions of statistical interest, a region of ecological interest that, that you then get uh, um, eco space outputs summarized over. Um, but as you can see, uh, if you can imagine, um, if eco space runs full on with a lot of number of groups, um, the amount of data it can produce in output can be quite staggering. Ecospace fishing is important to quickly highlight. Uh, so fishing relies on the on the base economic values from ecopath. So what uh, what what are the different costs? What are what what do you get for your fish? What do you get for your landings? Um, total fishing effort comes from ecosim that gets spatialized in ecospace, and in ecospace fishing effort is distributed by a gravity model, where the effort is proportional to the gains of your uh, of your uh, expert of exploitation of a cell. So fishermen are presumed to have perfect knowledge about the species are. Uh, and they'll try the species that they get most for, they'll bycatch, uh, but they get constrained in, for instance, the, the economic evaluation of, uh, well, how far do you have to sail from port, where it's expensive to fish, uh, what are my fixed costs, what's the dynamic costs. Fishermen make that kind of evalu evaluation to in the distribution of effort. But uh, the key thing is that fishing effort distribution is just an output of ecospace. Ecospace needs, e ecospace distributes the effort for you. It's not an input. The input comes from Ecosim. Um, Ecospace has different ways to restrict where fishing happens. You can set marine protected areas that close specific cells for fish, specific fleets for specific months. So MPAs can be open or closed certain parts of the year and don't have to necessarily apply to all the fleets at the same time. So that's what the MPAs do. It's very cool. Um, you can also, for instance, block. Um, you can also block certain fisheries operating in certain habitats. For instance, uh, um, block under sort of depth range, or for instance, in the good old days, it was not possible to troll over rocky bottoms. I think they've solved that now. But uh, so you, you could limit fishing effort over certain habitats. A brief one about species movement. As I said earlier, species move in ecospace because of dispersal, the random motion, uh, random movement because of the, just going about your day-to-day -day business, um, about migration, the, the targeted movement, and advection because of currents. Uh, as species basically haven't moved, all the species disperse to some degree. And there is this trade that the species make between good feeding conditions in a cell versus uh, a risk of predation. And better feeding and low risk predation means that a species has a higher chance of staying in a cell where conditions are better. So species don't know wh where good conditions are, but they may run into them. And if they like, if they're in a, con in a space where conditions are better, then they're more likely to stay. So that's basically how the species move in eco in eco space. Um, and Ecospace has a dynamic niche model that re-evaluates the suitability of different cells for every time step, for every species. And that is driven by a whole range of assumptions that uh, I'll show a bit later. But in principle, you've already seen this for Ecosim the, with the environmental preferences, right? Uh, you can have any number of environmental conditions that you, in Ecospace, uh, in Ecosim or forcing functions in Ecospace are maps. You can have, a, for instance, a map, uh, this is your depth map, say, and you've got a temperature map. You may have uh, something else. You may oxygen. You can, you can, you can add different layers. Or what you can do, Ecospace is, does not explicitly represent the depth layer. We, Ecospace 
that that's one of the reasons ecospace runs so nicely fast we don't account for what happens in the various layers in the in 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 the water column but you can still explicitly represent the stratification of the food web by um having benthic things eat benthic things pelagic things eat pelagic things and in your drivers for instance include uh surface temperature uh, bottom temperature etc and make bottom temperature sensitive species only respond to bottom temperatures and surface sensitive species only respond to surface temperatures etc you can still get the dynamics throughout the water column without explicitly having to account for it it's kind of neat um, what i'm just trying to get at here is uh, there's this system that um combines the different tolerances to environmental conditions as a multiplicative factor multiplicative factor to to define how suitable a cell is for a species. Well, that suitability is translated in the code by, by scaling the size of the foraging arena. So it gets harder to eat if a cell becomes unsuitable. So species will prefer less a cell that is not suitable. But um, this is not a guarantee that species will be in that cell where, where, where that are suitable or that species will not be in a cell that's unsuitable because there's other considerations at play as well. It could be that a cell is unsuitable, but there's such a high prey density that they still find enough to eat, right? Or the cell could be super su super suitable, but it could be full of predator predators. They don't want to be there. So the niche model just defines the suitability, but the food web dynamics will determine where species actually are. It's kind of cool. Um, this is a schematic overview how the um, how the niche model works, the, the habitat foraging capacity model. It's um, you can you can combine several hypotheses to what species how how your species uh, utilize um, the the area. Um, you can for every group decide whether they use habitat affinities or environmental preferences or both. So you can say, okay, the species really likes gravel, but it's very salinity dependent. Uh, those kind of combinations, you can you can you can enable that. Uh, you can also every group has an input capacity. Those those we call niche priors. It's like, okay, listen, uh, ecospace, whatever you want to do, I want to restrict my species to this area because I know that's where they are. This, for instance, could be a native range. That's where species have been observed. So regardless of where where what kind of habitat affinity they have or what kind of environmental preferences, this is the box that they had to stay within this area. So that, that is something you could set in your niche priors. Uh, you could, or you can, for instance, obtain this from a species distribution model. It's like, listen, <laughs> my species distribution model output goes here and don't do anything else here space, just use this. That's kind of cool. Uh, these can also change over time, these, these, um, these niche maps. And you can then further augment the system by including habitat preferences um, and environmental sensitivities. So this gives you a lot of bandwidth to play with in, uh, in determining where the species can be. Uh, so Vili, Kim and Marta, they will talk much more about this in, in, the, in the weeks to come. So I'll stop here. Let's, uh, let's go back to plugins. And these plugins will connect a bit to what I told before to show you what kind of utility they can have, like a bit of coding. Uh, um, Jerome, uh, yes, Carl. before you go to the plugins, could I just make a couple of comments about Ecospace and things? Please a couple do. Of the things you said weren't quite correct. Okay. Uh, first point here is that the you you don't go you don't build an Ecospace model because you know there's spatial dynamics going on. A lot of the spatial dynamics uh, are captured already in in the ecopath diet matrix. A lot of the structure, the diet matrix represents spatial structure and who's overlapping with who. All righty. So you, you do ecospace when you have a spatial policy question, like protected areas and stuff like that, or environmental change over time. Not, not just in order to build a, a better biology model, because almost always you don't end up with a better model. You end up with something that's too complicated, has too many parameters, mm -hmm. and doesn't work as well. Uh, second thing is that ecospace effort dynamics don't assume perfect knowledge. They assume exactly the opposite. 
the gravity model formulation assumes that fishermen make an awful lot of mistakes in the way they target uh, uh, fishing opportunities. Uh, full knowledge, they wouldn't go to a lot of places. And you can control how uh, bad their knowledge is with a power parameter that's in the eco space uh, effort dynamics interface you raise that power you make them better and better at finding the best places to go uh, a third thing is that there's a capability in ecospace such that if you have one migratory species it's common for example for small pelagics to undergo a strong seasonal migration uh, north south along coastlines or inshore and offshore and so on like that you can uh, tell ecospace to not have the piscivores that eat those little fish migrate explicitly, but instead you can tell ecospace to have them move along food availability gradients. And then as you, uh, as you migrate the migratory uh, small pelagic with the explicit migration route each year, the big things that eat it will follow it along, essentially finding it, uh, finding it how its concentrations are varying. So there's some uh, simple ways to more simply capture the multi-species seasonality of, uh, of migratory patterns for a lot of species. Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but I figured I'd better throw that out before you. No, no, of course, you. of course. Nice. And and in the next few sessions, we'll talk much more about this. So uh, it'll be very useful. Yeah. Okay, good. So shall we shall we carry on? Thanks, Carl. Um, one, thing's, one thing I contributed to Ecospace is the Spatial Temporal Data Framework. It's a plugin that basically solved uh, a shortcoming in the approach to bring in external data while the model takes over. Uh, in early version of, of Ecopath, uh, we're talking pre-2012, the internal data model of Ecospace was very hard to get to, and it was difficult to insert dynamic changing conditions in, uh, across the area. And we needed to have that in, in order to uh, you know, in, incorporate, for instance, environmental impact and things like that, dynamics in environmental impact. So the spatial temporal data framework is basically an, a GIS toolkit that can bring Ecospace maps from external data for, from GIS data sources, geographic information system data sources, uh, into the majority of Ecospace input layers and can also export Ecospace layers back as GIS files. Um, which basically allows Ecospace to be much more connectable, interconnectable with other tools from the outside. Uh, and this is very powerful in combination, of course, with the habitat foraging capacity model, where species, uh, you know, temperatures change and species affected by temperature respond and the food web responds, things like that. Um, in principle, another conceptual diagram, this is what the spatial temporal framework is. You just have your repositories of GS data of maps over time that you find interesting. You can use those maps to build your, uh, define your base map with. Uh, so they come in, in, in raster format. Or when the model ticks over over time, you can bring in maps from external data sources and insert those into the running model. And your results can be exported again as GIS data. Principle, very simple but there are some things afoot here. But this opened up Ecospace for a whole range of interesting things that before were it was able to do, but it was just clumsy and it made things much, much easier. We can exchange data with GS, with other models. We can bring status maps in, expert opinions. And this, 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 it, oh, it cracked the box open for data into in, in connectivity with Ecospace. Um, Internally, it's a bit of a modular structure where you have basically, uh, you, you, you bring in data in three stages. First, you locate where it is. So you have an access component that can deal with different sources of data. Uh, it could be files in your system, could be a web server, could be, so for instance, Global Fishing Watch could be one. It could be another model that has maps for you that you, that simply this, this locates the data and makes it available to Ecospace. Uh, then there's a conversion process that brings that translate the data from the raw data into a map format Ecospace can use. That's a separate, whole separate step. And there's an integration step where that raster, the, the grid 
ready for ecospace inserted in the right moment and also triggers the right things in ecospace to have that map have an impact for instance if you change in habitat map uh, in ecospace there might be species that respond that whose niche capacity responds to habitat well those species need to those calculations need to get a kick as well the, the, to make sure that the uh, habitat suitability is reevaluated etc and all these things again this is a plugin but these are also plugins so you can add with simple plugin code you can throw a link out to a new source of data uh, gs data um conversions if we need gs operations that we didn't have before you can add them in again plugins and the integration logic is uh, built into ecospace that that's something you cannot really mess with from the outside you don't want to so this is a paper that I wrote in 2013 for my master's thesis. This little diagram took two years of my life. Uh, but it's an interesting paper where we had an existing model of the Adriatic and we brought in uh, primary productivity trends from CVIFs, 10 years data. And uh, we compared how the model ran before. We started inserting data at the given moment. Here you see the, the monthly variation or the annual variation there in primary productivity and we quantified how the model behaved with this insertion and well of course the model the fit was much much better it was, a, it was a very nice exercise but this is just to showcase the kind of things you can do with coding and how it can really make ecospace uh, work much better um how do you parameterize a spatial temporal framework? Well, this is, an, uh, this is a case study of a meta training model I was working on. All of these are data sources. Uh, here you can see the name. This is for the Mediterranean hindcast for bottom chlorophyll A. We've got uh, the top and the 50 meters chlorophyll A here, soup, zooplankton, uh, etc. Th these are all data sets for a given variable for a given time period running from 1950. In 1990 to 2016, uh, all these are just data sets that point to specific maps that tick over time. And if you look into one of those, you have a name, a bit of a description, and here are maps, and every map is simply time ticked. So if this is uh, this is from 19, 1990 January, so great. This is just these files are once per year. these are annual, not monthly. So basically, this is a data set that indi that indexes. Uh, distributions of zooplankton integrate over the water column for the 1st of January. And when Ecospace takes over, those maps then get integrated into the running model and affect the driver layer that, uh, that Ecospace responds to. Uh, this is what it looks like, for instance, in the interface. Here we have, uh, we have connected a relative PP map to an external data set. Uh, here you see the data set overlapping with the model runtime. And the green dots means that there's an external data point and the dots are green, which means the data was found and it was compatible with Ecospace. So the, the data at least covered the whole box of Ecospace. There were, there were no gaps. That's what this green dot, and the green dot says everything was fine. So what this means, yeah, when Ecospace runs, those uh, those maps get inserted at those moments into the correct layer. And if for a given month, no data is inserted in a the layer, then the layer is either left in place, because for instance, environmental driver layers that describe temperature or, or salinity, Ecospace doesn't manage them. But if you, for instance, force the biomass of a species in a layer, well, you may force it in one month, and then the next month, Ecospace will take over production and uh, predation, and then so it will maintain, well, it will start varying the layer until next, the spatial temporal framework inserts new data. That's basically what the spatial temporal framework does. Um, a few notes about it. Um, it's an incredible, powerful tool. Uh, Kim and Marta and Vili will demonstrate more about it in the next few sessions. Uh, right now, it's only available through professional license, uh, the, the, the tool, because it needs more work. Uh, and it has an onboard GIS engine that makes it very easy to integrate data into Ecospace. That's a, that's a benefit. But uh, that's immediately also a big warning flag. It's uh, if you rely too much on an easy solution, uh, that you can really, you can, may not notice that that the data may cause errors. For instance, uh, if you let a GIS tool so, uh, interpolate data without you controlling the process, you might get GIS interpolation artifacts. It might you might use the wrong algorithm to translate the data from the original format to your ecospace map. If you don't supervise those kind of processes, yeah, you you can get surprises. 
Um, other thing with JS data is very typical, and you see that uh, a lot when you start using Ecospace with external data. Uh, you may have a certain base map, but the model that delivers your, the biochemical model that delivers your data does not have exactly the same depth values as you, the, the, sa the same water cells as you. It might not have values for coastal cells. So what do you do with when certain areas are not covered by your external data? What do you do with the cells of missing data? Right, Th those kind of things you need to be aware of. So you basically need to know your data, fully. Yeah, just uh, just uh, uh, strengthening what you're saying here. Um, the simple spatial framework is the uh, foundation for what you'll hear about the next two Thursdays in the presentation by Kim de Mutzert and by Vasu Capuzzi about two environmental um, impact assessment activities and also for Marta Cole's presentation in a couple of weeks, uh, in two weeks. And what, one of the things we learned from this is exactly what's on this slide here. You really have to be careful when you're working with spatial data. And going, so it, it can be such things as things just shift one cell. And uh, that leads to things not being in the right place. So the hard bottom is not where it should be. And it's it's this is tedious and it's it, it is uh, there's a lot of work going into actually making sure that these things do what they're told to do. This is a known issue whenever you're dealing with GIS and uh, you have the different form for for projections that are used there. So it's more complex than what we normally work with in EWE and what's in the distributed version. And the only way that uh, we can keep this going is through this um, pro, pro license that we are using for the temporal spatial framework. It is, uh, yeah, it's a bit more complicated. If when I work with this, uh, I found the perfect solution to how to make it work, uh, and that's get your own and Joe on the project. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Yeah, well, and we've been actually been thinking about uh, building a course as GIS processing for marine biologists, just to to summarize all the issues that we run into. It could be interesting. I mean, uh, just to uh, based on the experiences that we've we gained in uh, in the past ten years, because GIS processing it's a science by itself, um, and it is, uh, and it seems deceivingly easy to have a magic button in eco space that can just do it for you. But yeah. If you don't really know what it's going to do and where it's going to push your model, that could be problematic. And also, the GIS engine, as it says, it needs a bit more work as well. Really? No, it just that in spite of these warnings, this actually works really well. It's very stable. Uh, I've come back to years after doing runs and have updated the version, and the thing, damn thing is still working pretty well. It's, yeah. So, uh, this is actually fantastic, what we're talking about here. Uh, but but it's not simple. Okay, thank you. Good work in progress as ever, but uh, but a lot of fun. And I mean, you can see the potential of connecting this to your to the dynamic niche model in EcoSpace to making your MPAs change shape over time, uh, implement habitat degradation, implement all kind of kind of changes in the environment that your poor ecosystem suffers from. Uh, this unleashes a whole set of, uh, of of new capabilities. It's very cool. Yeah. Uh, but there are simple. I thought you were going to talk about this, but there are ways of making it simpler. Simpler than what we do when we have a big complex project with high dynamic models and so on. If you can read these, if you if you can turn those into raster maps and load those in, uh, you know set that up. There are simpler ways of doing it. So don't despair because we're saying it can be very complex. Mm -hmm. There are ways of making it simpler. So in that case, if you, if you, for instance, are, have activities where you think, oh, this would be really need to use this, uh, let's discuss it. Sure. Sure. Oh, yeah, of course. No, yeah, I don't mean to discourage you. I'm just raising a flag here. I mean, I would feel guilty if I didn't, but it is, uh, no, but it's certainly doable. And, uh, and the amount of power you unleash in EcoSpace is fantastic. It's, it's uh, yeah, I'm happy with this. 
Um, so right now, the spatial temporal framework can process and can drive the content of many different layers. So you can drive your primary productivity patterns. So stay where, okay, where's the production more than elsewhere? How the production uh, spatially distributes over time. Uh, you can drive, you can assign any number of environmental drivers and make those time varying to affect your ecosystem's well-being. You can change your habitats. You can change, but you can also say like, listen, ecospace, uh, don't compute niches. I've got niches for you. I've got this uh, fantastic Bayesian tool that has produced my species niches. Uh, let's bring that instead. Um, you can change the layout of MPAs. You can you can force the biomass of certain groups. We do that typically in activities like FishMIP, where we do this uh, large, uh, these global ecosystem modeling exercises where different uh, models run in parallel using the same driver sets. Um, we typically force the, the biomass of phytoplankton groups, uh, one, two, or three phytoplankton, phytoplankton groups. We can also bring in contaminant forcing. You can have, for instance, uh, you can represent Fukushima leaking radiation. You can have Sellafield leaking radiation. You can have other things uh, if you have source of contaminant for the ecosystem to pick up. You can influence where fishing happens. You can bring in currents that, that float things around, uh, so current patterns that change. Uh, you can change even migration maps. There's, there's so much you can do with this. And all these things uh, unleash new capabilities in the ecospace which were a big game changer for the tool. Um, other tools, maybe less sexy, but also very util. Yeah, um, one neat, neat one we recently built was MPA Dynamics. Um, MPAs prohibit uh, where, where fishing is prohibited for, uh, prohibit uh, fishing for certain fleets for certain months. Um, and you have maps where MPAs, where the MPA cells are. So you can, identi you can identify with maps in ecospace where the MPA is placed in the spatial temporal framework. You can change those maps layout if you want, but you could not change the way MPAs are enforced over time. You, so if an MPA would come enforced later on, uh, why well, you could, for instance, define an MPA without any cells and the spatial temporal framework enables certain cells. But what if the MPA suddenly implies instead of half a year uh, closed is now fully closed or uh, at a given moment in time, an MPA opens up for certain fleets. So the enforcement changes. How would you implement that? So the MPA dynamics tool is a very lightweight tool that does that for you. You basically can, uh, you can in a CSV file state what and how and how the MPAs uh, behave over time. Uh, this is the initial status. This is a uh, version of the model that has two MPAs that are closed for the whole year and all the fleets are allowed in. But in, in January 1998, MPA 1 is suddenly closed for these fleets. And in January 1st, 1996, uh, this MPA opens up for certain months in the year. So it remains closed for the others, but suddenly now starts enforcing for different fleets. Fine. And in 2006, it closes for the whole year. So this basically changes the the enforcement strategy of, of, of MPAs over time. Little utility that just uh, sets sort of flags that you could change an in interface as well, but does that basically for you doing a run somewhere halfway. It creates, yeah, this is powerful. You, know, you, you can certainly uh, yeah, modify your MPAs. Uh, another thing that is uh, recently submitted was Eco Engineer, was an experiment at the UCT, is a PhD thesis of uh, Sachi. Um, she used mediation in Ecosim to infer a, from alien invader biomass what kind of engineering structures that would create for certain ecosystem components, and then ecosystem components would respond with the response curve to the to the biomass change of eco engineers. She used uh, it's very cool what she did. She used Blender, the three D software, to physically model engineer shapes, the the, the barnacles and and the muscles, and in a big virtual fat in the uh, fat in the three D software, she would pour an X amount of shells and then measure the amount of free space in between accessible to certain critters. So she used 3D modeling software to uh, to see how much different combinations of, of critters would generate uh, engineering space for others. And that then she turned into mediation functions. But for ecospace, she wanted to try something else. Rather than using mediation, she wanted to uh, use the capacity model to uh, to do this. So basically from the biomass of engineering um, 
she did, we built a plugin that that listens to the biomass of of eng, eco engineer species, and based on her experiments in Blender, would come up with a res- you could set a response curve to those biomasses in order to uh, affect the, the capacity for species that benefit from the engineering bio, from the engineering presence from the, from the engineering changes in in the, the changes in engineer biomass. It's a, it's a very cool paper. Um, hopefully, it will be out soon. And the Eco Engineer plugin is going to be is already part of the latest release, so you can look it up in EcoSpace. Uh, another thing we built for uh, CFAS is something that is a, a transact extraction in the interface in the plugin interface. You can draw transacts for which you want to have summaries. You want to rather than sifting through tons of maps of, of, of biomass, you just want to have indicators of the ecosystem across transacts. So you draw these lines, and when EcoSpace runs, you can you can see how the how the different EcoSpace variables behave or throughout the transact. It's just another way of getting at large and complex data. There, there's utility in this as well. And before we go on, I uh, well now we go on to something else. I want to show how we've used EcoSpace to reach totally different audiences, how EcoSpace has been uh, utilized for other things. But before we go on, do we have any questions? Is there anything in the chat that we want to respond to? No? Santiago, Vili, nothing? Go ahead. Okay, good. So, um, this is more on a, this more co- also code focused. Um, how we have integrated ecospace in places that uh, ecosystem model, models normally don't come. Uh, and the first one is the MSP Challenge Simulation Platform. It says um, the MSP Challenge Platform is a series game that allows spatial planners, maritime spatial planners, that prepares sp- maritime spatial planners for the MSP uh, process. So to make them aware about the trade-offs and information discovery, et cetera, of, um, of an MS, of an planning exercise. It's a series game where multiple players uh, interact in, as groups of users to manage an ecosystem. At least they are part of the ecosystem. Um, and the ecosystem is, uh, there are three ecosystems that we can, you can play the game now. We have the North Sea, we have the Baltic and with the Firth of Clyde, and there's also a game in progress uh, being built for the Adriatic. So players would uh, represent a part of the North Sea, for instance, would, uh, a country, England or Holland or Germany or, or Denmark, and would have to achieve a certain spatial plan in the next 40 years. And for that, have to find, uh, have to def- have, have to make planning decisions in terms of energy, um, harbor, manual extraction, recreation, water extraction, uh, mining, wind farms. There's all, there's all these planning activities that uh, there's about forty different activities that they can undertake. Um, and the fun thing is, of course, is when you when you need to find a space for your plan, you first have to take your national interest into account, but you also have your neighbors to consider. You cannot put uh, a wind park in somebody else's shipping route. I mean, that don't make you popular. So you have to negotiate. Uh, there's also limits limits in in, in multi use. I mean, uh, yeah, aquaculture and wind parks go together, but a wind park normally would mean an absence of fishing, etc. So there's all these these trade offs that that the planners. Uh, Explore in a GIS kind of interface where you can sketch your parks, uh, sketch your plans, uh, say when it becomes active, but also need then need, go to, need to negotiate with your neighbors to see okay how how, how we're going to resolve any conflicts. Um, so you basically the whole idea about this game is that you learn about the interplay between the often conflicting planning activities uh, applied to so- society and recently also with ecology. So, as I said, uh, the MSP session captures existing activities that you build onto. So it's based on on uh, what currently is happening in the area, and then and, and looking forward. Um, planning is happens first in a cycle for the next ten years, and then for the next twenty or thirty years. Um, and the cool thing is that after planning activity, I and mean, when all the plans have been approved, this, the game enters a simulation phase. 
And during the simulation phase, uh, sp spatial pl plans that have been approved gradually come into force. Uh, first in simulation for 10 years and in simulation for 20 or 30 years after, after the second round of planning. And then there's three built-in simulation uh, models that respond. There's shipping, there's ecology, and there's energy. And after an after simulation phase, uh, exp the outcomes are explored in the group by, by a moderator and participants can go for the next planning round. So what does a session, the game session look like? It's basically a one-day session where first the participants get introduced to the, the issues and to the software. I mean, it is, of course, a complex interface. Uh, three hours of planning based on, on the current status quo, the people build plans. Uh, during a lunch break, we run a 10-year simulation. Uh, then we figure out what the, what hell happened. Uh, of course, rarely plans turn out as intended. So there's another planning, planning phase where you try to fix things for the next 40 years. Then over a coffee break of 15 minutes, we run 30-year simulations. And then there's a wrap-up session. That's typically how the game works. And yeah, and if for ecology, we, uh, we put EcoSpace in, and that was fun. But it also means that simulation runs uh, during coffee break for 20 or 30 years. It needs to run all fast. EcoSpace is not the only tool in, in here. Um, there's much more happening. So that meant that we had to take certain trade-offs. Uh, we had to favor perform performance over realism. So how did we do it? Here, here you see... Uh, with regards to EcoSpace, we have the players here that make they make planning actions. They get all stored on the MSP server and doing an. Uh, uh, there's sort of there's basically people working on connected laptops, uh, like up to eight or nine laptops with player groups of four or five behind each laptop, uh, where they design their actions. And when the simulation phase comes, time ticks over, and we translate these actions into the impacts on the ecosystem. EcoSpace calculates the impact, sends it back, and the players see their ecosystem go to hell. Um, or response, let me put it that way. Um, but the interesting thing is, of course, how do you translate things like a wind park or gravel extraction or shipping or a harbor? How do you translate it to ecological impact? Well, you cannot, of course, bring a wind park into ecospace. There's no environmental driver layers for wind parks. You can build them, but it's meaningless. You, for, you need to translate those spatial presences of activities into the disturbances that they generate. And, and those you can make your ecosystem respond to. So what we did in the case of the MSP activity, we only chose five different uh, types of disturbance. We have generic noise. We have disturbance, disturbance at the bottom and the surface. We have the generation of art artificial substrate. And we have the absence of fishing. It's very simplistic, but again, uh, you cannot make this very extensive because of simply performance uh, gains. And we decided to build a system that at first was just indicative of what might happen to the ecosystem. So Ecospace handles the spatial and temporal interplay of food web, fisheries and environmental change, and uh, food response and cascades. And for instance, this is an idea that uh, um, from taken from the Clyde game, where we have a certain shipping intensity map that generates a noise profile and service disturbances. And to which the cetaceans respond by moving out of the way because they don't like that so much. Just to give you an idea, and, and, and every planning activity of the 40 generates all contribute to noise and service disturbance and other, and well, these five uh, disturbances and the food web response in kind. Um, we connected these pressures to standard ecospace uh, concepts for instance, artificial substrate translates into habitat maps, and species can really like, some species really like artificial substrate. Um, service disturbance, bottom disturbance, and noise were brought in as environmental driver maps to which species responded, mostly by moving out of the way. Um, the absence of fishing, we control that through MPAs. So basically, we build, a, we, if you put a and um, a wind park down somewhere, uh, the MPA server, the MSP server would generate an MPA map uh, where fishing could not take place and the eco, and the eco space would uh, pick that up. Uh, and there's something also like uh, not shown in the previous um, slides, but um, players could also ramp up or decrease the fishing intensity, which translates into a fishing effort multiplier that we have in, in eco space. And then the outputs are simplified as well. I mean, um, the MSP 
MSP setup in Ecospace has a tool library where you can define which kind of output you want to show to users, and you can uh, you can aggregate your Ecospace outputs per group or per fleet into something that's more useful to the to the to the MSP players. So, for instance, you want to have iconic species, you want to know what happens to your dolphins, or you want to know what happens to your commercial species, or you want to have an overview of etc. Um, so, in, that allows it's just to condense the, the massive amount of outputs from Ecospace into something that is meaningful for the for the MSP game. There's also two indicators we, uh, that we can produce. Biodiversity indicator right now. Ecospace is much more to offer, but this is what we have connected now in uh, at, at this first version. Other things that are also quite interesting is that, for instance, some MSP activities have lifespans. For instance, if you uh, place a wind park, the first two years you'll have a construction phase where there's going to be a lot of noise, a lot of bird, bottom, bottom disturbance, and there's no fishing. And when the construction phase is over, the noise dies down. You don't have pylon driving anymore. You simply now have rotor, rotor hum and those kind of things. Um, and bottom disturbance is done. But now we certainly have artificial substrate that species can latch onto, and they're still in the in protection factor in place. So there's there's those kind of dynamics that you can that can be put into the MSP game as well. So um, I can keep I can elaborate much further, but I'll leave it at this. Um, go to mspchallenge.info. You can download the game yourself, and you can play games. You can you can you can mess around with this. There's a nice manual, uh, and uh, you can join online games or create one yourself, and you can explore. It's, uh, it's, it's fun. Um, and they're working to make this an open source com an open source tool and want to work within the community to extend and find new applications. Uh, but I think this is a very powerful showcase of how Ecospace can be used in an arena that normally you would never, ever come with an ecosystem model. This is uh, just goes to show what, what you can do. Another thing I want we to had yeah. a, just mention we had uh, we had uh, the Dutch developers coming over for the Everpart thirty five conference to yep. give a one day session after the conference. Uh, then where participants in the in the work in the conference basically played for for a day to be ecosystem now what do you call it spatial planners. It was yep. really successful. They it's they said fun. that it, yeah you were there yeah it's true and they said they never had people that were so collaborative it's all ecologists all fish huggers that wanted to work together there was no conflict everybody safe well except for Howard Townsend who had just uh, wanted to um, he, he played the devil's advocate it was very funny so, okay. but it it was very fun it's just very nice to see how how things respond and nothing is ever easy in planning I mean there's uh, what what ecospace. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Philly. Yeah, for instance, here in in, uh, in in the Strait of Georgia, there's now a big planning exercise that's supposed to start up, well, starting up, and it would be obvious when you have such an activity to early on have a session of this kind for people from various sectors to learn what's involved in that process and how do you work together. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, but like even, even for us that we are kind of like training this, we run simulations and stuff that we thought that were gonna go in one way and they went completely the other. So it, it, it was pretty neat to see how unexpected things can like bite you. So uh, this is a fantastic tool. Nice. And, but it makes after you do the dissemination and you drill deeper into your model, it starts making sense. I mean, for instance, the MPA paradox is something that you see happening in the in the MSP uh, game. We did a test session in uh, in the North Sea, where you close an area down for fishing, and yeah, your 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 species that you want to protect builds up because. But at some point, the buildup is so high that predators move in, and they chase the poor things out of the MPA again. So all this planet, but we had it so well planned. Yeah, but ecology happened. It, it's it's very interesting. You get those kind of things. And what's even more fun. Uh, when we delivered the North Sea game, I, I did the coding and, and somebody else, uh, Ro Giovanni Romagnoni, adapted the, the Steve Magenson's horrend horrendous uh, North Sea model um, for MSP game. We had a test session where the focus was on ecology. The, the focus was that the, there were just going to be ecologists there testing how the ecological model worked. And they all started planning. And at the end of the first simulation session, ecology was really, really 
really suffering and people had forgot to plan for ecology. They were so caught up in the planning exercises and putting things down were so much fun that nobody thought about the ecology. It was fantastic. Anyway, that's sort of what happens in the real life, I guess, as well. But MSP Challenge is it's just an incredible fun tool. Well, and the last thing I want to present to you is OceanVis. That's also something that is, uh, yeah, it's an experiment that started quite a while ago in uh, in Vancouver. This is the immersion lab that we have in Vancouver, where you see big screens, you see a round table, and a screen in the back. The screen in the back is meant for a moderator that knows a system that gathers input from the people around the table around different possible fishing scenarios. And then on the screens around you, you see the, the ecosystem come to life. You don't see graphs and charts. No, you see 3D fishes and animals in a simulated underwater, uh, underwater environment driven by Ecopath. That's in a nutshell, ecos ocean fish. The paper for this thing is just finally out. Uh, came out a few weeks ago. If you, here's the reference. Feel free to look it up. Ocean Viz is basically a virtual, a virtual field trip to show the ecosystem as it is to policymakers. So to take people away from the graphs and charts. Uh, and it's what, one important challenge that we had with OceanVis is not only connecting an ecosystem model to a 3D modeling software, but also to show change. So it's just basically an in, in, in immersive 3D viewer of an underwater system where we have tons of uh, uh, a library, a huge library of 3D animated critters that get spawned in in locations that are realistic. I mean, uh, plants and corals spawn where they shoot, pelagic species spawn where they shoot, etc. in numbers that correspond to the prediction of the ecosystem model. That in turn responds to fishing policy changes set by the participants that, that, that discuss uh, and try different trade-offs in different scenarios. So there's a lot of features that, Eco that OceanVis has that all relates to the 3D. Um, we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, I'll, I, I'll skip over this. It's just, just, uh, but what is it? Here's some screenshots what, uh, what OceanVis can do. Here's, for instance, the OceanVis plugin in the Ecopath software and the assets, the OceanVis visualizations themselves we've used in different movies. And well, you can just generate very pretty pictures. This is pure eye candy. Um, but this is, for instance, uh, what OceanVis could look like. Here we, this is this experiment of visualizing change. We have three sli time slices of, an, uh, of a simulation, 2005, 2020, and 2100. And we pull the same school, of, we visualize the same school of fish, the same animals, uh, how, and, and show how different they might look in different time slices of, yeah, in different time slices based on a series of assumptions. Um, Early versions of OceanVis had a timeline view that would just gradually tick over time to see the ecosystem change, but we realized that halfway simulation, you forget what your starting situation was. But like this, if you put it in three slices beside each other, you have a much more visual reference how things have changed. And uh, it's just another way you can do it if you if you code and connect your ecosystem model to fun tools. Just um, Just to show you. Philly, you had anything to add? You said it. Good. So I'll leave you alone now. There was there was the whole part about, about coding and then what you can do with code and where coding is uh, can be fun. Um, I want to also. I thought this slide was uh, because I'm I'm in, in charge of keeping the EcoPath ecosystem alive. Uh, I manage at least the source code and and releases and and feature additions and all that kind of thing. I sort of Keep that under control. I thought it was a good moment to discuss this as well. How does the Ecopath ecosystem work as a whole? Um, it's important to know that the Ecopath ecosystem, it's, it's Ecopath is a community-driven software and we don't have any core funding. Nobody is paying to keep Ecopath going. There's, there's, there's no, no base funding for. Uh, it doesn't really help as well that Joe and me, the two programmers, are self-employed. We don't have any fixed job. I mean, we don't, we, this is, our livelihood. So we, we need to find a way to, to keep going. So what we basically need, we need users like you guys to be involved. People come with new ideas, want to apply the tool to new situations. Take, for instance, the example we show. There's plenty of exa examples that passed by in the past sessions. I mean, Dave Chigaris with his uh, mortality forcing, for instance, uh, that we discussed the other day. 
that's one of those ideas that came to about and he approached us and we built it he tested it and we will release it soon and you know it's new one new edition and that uh, keeps us busy and keeps the software growing um so we really want users to be involved in determining where the ecopath software goes to what what, what it can do in the future what kind of needs we have and uh, there's no no one better to ask that than the user base um but the idea about adding new features is that if you have an idea you approach us the development team we build it together you publish you get all the credit but once it's published the features get added to the ecopath software and become available to the community at large so you contribute your software to the community the software is free open source and there's also ways to get you get a professional license and you can get technical support uh, we also have an ecopath research and development consortium which is the overarching umbrella that makes sure that ecopath behaves as it should because we we don't want just to add features because they can be added. There's also, uh, we also want to make sure that what we're doing is scientifically, scientifically well and sound. Um, so the, the Ecopath Consortium, it tries to do several things. It, it uh, organizes training courses like these ones, uh, just, uh, you know, just, just to make sure we train the highest quality, highest standard of, of, uh, of Ecopath. We pursue and execute projects with different configurations from within different uh, teams uh, and, and research groups, part of the consortium. We maintain the release of the software. We organize all activities to keep the software going, like uh, the development. We support users. We, uh, we bring in uh, and co-development, like the development of new features with users. And the consortium is open for any institute to join. Um, and we recently joined uh, back in, um, a Japanese Institute joined us, which is fantastic. And Vili, you had also some news that, uh, right? Yeah, and I think we are at about 30 institutions uh, now that have that are part of the consortium. Well, because we don't have any core funding, this is the best way just to spread the responsibility of keeping the software alive among institutes that have been that, that benefit from applying the software and making sure it's healthy and sound. Um, it, it sounds well. great, but that's not. But there's no money coming from there. There's no money in the consortium. It's not a legal entity. That's true. What uh, what we are relying on is is fully the uh, projects. Uh, hopefully, the professional license can help with this. So basically, that's an, that's uh, we're trying to get people to write it into projects. That uh, and the, the temporal spatial framework is the little carrot that we can hold up there because one really needs it for that. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is really a call uh, that in order for this to stay alive, development is needed. A software that's not continuously developed dies quickly. So this is, uh, it really is required f for people to engage, to, to keep things going. And so many people have built careers on working with EWE that uh, it would really be um, a pity if we aren't able to maintain it at the medium front. And by this, I, my time horizon, uh, when thinking about where things are going, uh, is five, ten years out. That uh, we, that's the kind of things that we, we need to, that we worry about. Yep. Yeah, and it is not only adding more features and building a Frankenstein model. That's not the idea. Um, but there's also things like when windows changes uh, like things get deprecated new features arise we need to adapt we need to change software we need to keep servers up and running need to test need to issue releases and all these things require time and money so we just uh, we are trying to find creatively ways to make that happen but bottom line is we will we need uh, active users to continue right so there's various ways you can do that there's an online community we've got the slack channel and there's also a user uh, uh, user forums that you can participate in. Um, if you use Ecopath, uh, consider taking out a support contract. That this uh, that helps a lot. We can. That means you get one on one time with uh, people from the from the core approach to help you out with uh, if you have a bottleneck in in applying the tool. That that could be very useful. Have you a good idea? Do you have something nice, uh, a nice idea that Ecopath cannot do and you need it? Well, consider code development. Uh, as Philly said, advanced features can be accessed through a pro license, like the spatial temporal framework. There's another plug in the Ecospace plugin that's also part of this. And pro 
a license comes also with support. So that's a way that institutes can contribute. If you have a project relies on EcoPath, put a license in, it helps. It is not, it, it is on a whole project budget, it is not that crazy and it helps us a ton. Also, there's also training courses. And we often get a question like, when is the next training course going to be? And the reply to that is often like, when do you want it to be? I mean, then let's organize something, right? It's a, it's a two-way street. We were more than happy to come to an institute and, and organize courses. For instance, uh, with Dave Chigaris, again, uh, we're planning to organize a programming course by the end of this year in Florida. So if you feel like knowing more about how to program Ecopath, come on and join up. Let's, uh, and and we'll, uh, we'll post information about that on Ecopath. Uh, Facebook and the website. And you can also consider uh, having your uh, institute uh, join the consortium. That's another way to, to greatly participate. And with that, I want to thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. That was a, a great overview of the source code and what we can do with it. And it's so nice that I don't have to talk all the time, that someone else can be blamed for that. Yes. But nice. it's great. Nice. Um, we are going to go to questions now, and we have 18 minutes left, uh, but I actually think that it would be a good idea to ask if Jeff wants to start the uh, by giving an overview of one of these papers that Jeroen has produced. Uh, yeah, sure. I was, uh, I was a little bit worried that Jerome may have covered all of it <laughs> as he went through the MSP stuff. Okay, so as Jerome was talking earlier, and I'm here giving a brief introduction to Jerome and his colleague's paper from last year, uh, combining ecosystem modeling with serious gaming in support of transboundary maritime spatial planning. So the, mar the marine spatial planning challenge simulation is uh, an integrative sort of platform that allows stakeholders and participants to integrate geographic maritime and marine data to model marine shipping, energy, and ecology. And um, the platform links these types of simulation models using a Unity game engine-based platform. And the activity essentially is sort of a role-playing type game for all the participants like Jerome covered earlier, uh, all the participants kind of sit around and they represent a part of a sea basin and they interact with each other and collaborate collaborate with each other to figure out plan, spatial planning in the region. And in this paper, Jerome and his colleagues connected uh, the MSP challenge simulation to EcoSpace to test the effects of these implementations of spatial plans on the ecological dynamics. And here I've included a conceptual diagram of how sort of the pathway works. You have the MSP players who make decisions and actions on what the regulations should be that gets plugged into the MSP servers and turn into pressures and disturbances in the ecosystem. And it goes into ecospace and it calculates into outcomes, which gets uh, translated back to the players, to the platform. And this allows this type of uh, digital gaming technology and interactive process allows uh, for planning support, stakeholder engagement, co-design of regulations, interactive scenario development, professional learning and student education. And in the paper, they look, they applied the MSP challenge simulation connected to Ecospace with uh, North Sea and first applied um, sea basins. Some interesting points that I, I thought were cool was that the enrichment of the MSP challenge simulation platform with ecological dynamics, which is really cool. And I thought a lot of it was very similar to GIS, but more interactive in a sense and used for marine planning. Um, something that Jerome mentioned as well, uh, they had to prioritize performance over realism. So simplified pressure systems and responses due to limitations in computational power. And this kind of leads into further development of uh, this interactive platform to strike a balance between adding complexity to the models, but also optimizing for participant engagement and learning. Um, as when you add more complexity, sometimes it, it makes it harder for the, the platform to discern between disturbances and like cause and effect. But overall, I thought 
uh, this platform's incredibly powerful <laughs> as it develops and it's highly adaptable and relatively easy to use. I thought it was super cool. Thank you. Now you need to come and play it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Nice. Yeah, you summarized it open well. Open for questions and comments and so on and so on. Oh my, that's a chat that's quite full. That's yeah. Cool. Jeff, if you would stop sharing, we can see all people. Yeah. There we go. No questions. Okay, we're done. Yuppie. Well, I hope you liked it. Well, I had a, no questions. Um, I think I put it up there, but um, there's a lot of chat going on. Uh, it's really awesome work that's going on, and I think we'll be talking more. I had one specific question about the Eco Engineers um, app. I hadn't seen that before, and I was wondering, it sounds like it was developed for an invasive species, which makes a lot of sense. I was wondering um, if it could be used for foundation species. So specifically here, I was thinking about oysters. And I know um, the paper that you worked on with Kim DeMutzer um, on river diversions in the Mississippi River, that that paper dealt with oysters with an external environmental capacity layer because oysters can, of course, be really difficult because they're like a functional group. They eat things, they're being eaten. They also provide habitat for fish and tunicates and a lot of things. And then those then change water quality and turbidity, which could then have mediation effects. Um, would in eco engineers was made after that paper, would that then kind of serve as in a similar way? Yeah, the eco engineer approach is more to based to to you want of course deal with the water quality for that and those those kind of effects would still be mediation, but just another way to approximate the 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 physical structure that the oysters create as a as habitat space for others, okay. just a different way to express that. That was eco engineer was based built for that, just to see if that would give different and better results in using plain mediation for that. Uh, I can probably share a version of that paper with you if you want, uh, just to see what they specifically did. I don't have the details on my head right now, but the, um, they found that uh, this gives you a more detailed and a more re predictable, a bit, but a better in that sense. It fits better to observations what the eco engineers do in terms of habitat construction. That makes sense. Yeah, I really like that. I'll follow up, I'll send you an email. Thank Good. You. We'll talk. Nice. Holden, when we're looking at you in your office there, I think I saw a telephone and a hand, a, a little hand calculator. Are you time warped from the last century? <laughs> you guys, does everyone remember this? <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> we are definitely seeing something from the last century there. Yes. In the meantime, uh, I saw there's a group in Europe uh, working uh, with the, uh, calling it. Um, uh, <clears throat> Our ensemble, uh, trying to build an uh, ensemble um, modeling. Uh, our package that uh, can communicate with the different models. Uh, are you in the EWE? I'm not part of that group. No, I, I haven't heard about that, but it could be if they need me. I would like that. Daniel uh, Vilas says. Uh, Hi, Jerome. Nice talk. There is this nice visual simulation tool created by NOAA, the virtual ecosystem scenario we, uh, viewer. Is that something that EII is involved in? It looked similar to OceanVis in my view. And uh, there is a link. And uh, I'll just share that link. Yeah, I mentioned uh, the VES viewer also in the EcoOcean paper. The VES ecosystem viewer is trying to do something a little bit different. We built OceanVis as a tool to cater to specific situations where you pre-design the visuals and pre-design a model to address specific research questions or policy questions that you run with specific researchers. Uh, in that sense, you can make an ecosystem model look much, much more rich 
than something that would know is doing. They just have a generic, they have a generic viewer to, re to reflect any ecosystem around the world. We took uh, specific care in Ocean Vis, for instance, to, uh, to well, to, to sh how do you show an ecosystem in, in, in one animation? I mean, not all the animals occur in the same place. You have species that, you know, and, 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 and habitat can be very diverse and species occur in very different areas, but yet they fall under the same policy question. So what we do in Ocean Vis, we generate larger habitat and with a camera path, you swim through the whole ecosystem and you visit all the different components and the different uh, habitats, as you will. And in hab every habitat, you can see what the ecosystem looks like. Those kind of things you could not build in a generic tool that just visualizes whole ecosystems. The idea is the same, of course. You've got 3D animals that you that you show uh, based on, on on numbers. So yeah, there, there's definitely overlap there. Yeah. The purpose now, is different. One, yeah. One one thing about OceanVis is that OceanVis is actually the reason why EWE is alive today, most likely. We uh, we were talking to Lenfest, and this was actually the first project that the Lenfest Ocean Program funded. Uh, was for us to develop the ocean vis as a way of communicating um, what happens in the oceans, and uh, we used that. We argued for that activity that uh, there was a lot of ex experience from uh, from ecopart ecosystem ecospace models, uh, and we could communicate in a way that was not tailored for scientists. So tables and figures and spreadsheets and all of that but visually instead and thinking more about how do you get something across to managers and uh, to do that we just happened to have to to uh, make it was just necessary to reprogram Ecopart to separate the data part from the computational course so that we could have different interfaces so echo, and that's where the ocean risk came in. It really was as a different interface to communicate changes in the ocean. Yep. And it led to a number of things, uh, including what you saw there, these really nice panels for how we visualize change. We went through a, quite a lot of, of uh, work and headache and so on, because we were running these nice simulations. And then when the, at the end of the simulation, where you've seen things, how things have developed in 70 years, well, when you got to when you got to 1980, you'd forgotten 1950, and when you got to the present, you know, you just you can't visual, you can't keep it in your head somehow. And the panels there was actually a really neat way of for visualizing chains. So there's a there's a quite a lot of uh, history behind the ocean base, and it really is what made it necessary, made it possible to argue. It was a million dollar argument for why we had to change the software in order to be able to make this, these visualizations. And in the process, we took care of all the other things, all the other things that presented. And yeah, that has given us the platform that uh, Ecopath now is. So um, it's been, it's been a win-win all around. Yeah, that part, yes. that part worked out. The communication part, we had much less success with. Oh, actually setting something up on how do you communicate that? And, and it was supposed to be a, a next phase for Lenfest. Yeah, but you know what? The interesting thing is now is that I think OceanVis, at least the concept, was about eight years ahead of its time. Now the European Union is demanding a lot of stakeholder involvement. And now mm -hmm. OceanVis is being put in proposals. Five years ago, there was no interest. There's my cat. That's my girl. Yeah. But um, no, but... Um, yeah, but five years five years ago, it was impossible to put ocean fish into projects. Now there's demand. That's also why this paper needed to be out because uh, yeah, we hope to be able to do much more with it. Yeah. I think the timing is now right for it. It was actually ocean fish was actually yeah, it was ahead of its time because we were actually the first to do three D visualizations, real lifetime uh, for when running simulations uh, yep. that were activities that would render it afterwards but being able to do it as you speak was something that we couldn't find anyone doing that pretty neat nice all right 
I think we're getting close to the end. This doesn't seem we've had, had quite a lot of number of discussions on chat, uh, so uh, that's good. And looking ahead, uh, I would like to mention that on Tuesday, I will be giving a brief introduction to Ecospace. You actually heard quite a bit of it from Jeroen today, and uh, that will include then uh, going through a tutorial where we'll build a spatial model. And today I will uh, upload the presentation and the tutorial to the Ecospace website. And I would actually encourage you to look at the tutorial before Tuesday. But we will go through it on Tuesday. The presentation is rather brief and I promise I won't talk for as long as you want. Would. Well, the difference is, of course, I want to get the tutorial in and it's a brief presentation. So, so I think it's, it's quite feasible. So that's one aspect of this. Another one is that um, we are we're having some uh, open door sessions, Santiago and I, every Monday, Wednesday and Friday from 1 to 2 in the afternoon here Pacific time. And uh, it's been, it's been uh, focused on the um, registered students for FIS 501, but there hasn't been, it hasn't been very busy. So I would actually like to open it up for everyone who's on this call and I will send you uh, an email about um, the details. Uh, I know it's a very inconvenient time for, for many of you if you are not in, in North America uh, or no, North or South America, uh, but uh, so be it. So if you would like to come and discuss anything related to uh, ecosystem modeling and if there's anything you think we can help with, then you'll be, uh, you're, you're most welcome to drop in to these open door sessions, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 to 2 Pacific. That's what I have on my list of things to remember. There was something I was going to tease your own with. I forgot what that was. Please remember after the session. <laughs> yeah. Oh. oh, really, your own super cool work and like you've talked about a lot of things that are pretty amazing. Too. Yeah, it was quite a bit, but I, I hope it was informative. And uh, would love you love to see you guys coding with us. Come come and do a course. It's going to be fun. Yeah, there's been a suggestion for a course on how to drive EWE with R, mm -hmm. and that would be an interesting one to to set up. Okay, folks. That's it for today. Thank you very much. Thank I think you. We're going to close the class now. It's 11 o'clock here. Thank you very much.